Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today we're talking about how small pieces of language combine into larger pieces, aka constituency. But first, Lauren, what have you been up to lately? I have been moving jobs, which also involves moving countries. So it's been a pretty busy month. Which literally involves moving around the world. Yes. So I have been migrating slowly westward for the last few years, uh, working in Singapore and more recently in London. And after two fabulous years of living in London, we are now on the move back to Melbourne, Australia, and I will be a David Myers Research Fellow at La Trobe University for the next three years, which I'm really excited about. It's an opportunity to bring together all of the different languages of Nepal and the kind of Tibetan work that I've been doing across phonetics and across grammar and across gesture, all into one big project. That's really cool. I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited to be back in Melbourne and uh, lots of lots of exciting research planned. What about you? What have you been up to? I've been doing a lot of writing on the book. Uh, what else is new? Yeah. And I'm headed to the LSA Summer Institute, aka Ling Institute, where I'm going to be teaching a class on linguistics outreach. So that's exciting. Awesome. And I was recently in less momentous, but still very important news. I was recently in an NPR article about the linguistics of doggo. I just love, I love when internet language memes make it into the news cycle and a whole new audience who've never experienced the meme kind of get it translated for them. Yeah. And they're like, wow, this is so cool. But also what is this? So if you haven't encountered the doggo meme, it's based around a couple a Facebook group and a, a Twitter account and a, just a general zeitgeist about a slightly different cute way of talking to your dogs and about your dogs. And I had a lot of fun with the reporter and we actually talked for like an hour and a half. And so not all of that made it into the article. There's more. So we'll link to the article in the show notes. But there's even more reason that story that didn't make it in. And so we've actually made a Patreon bonus this month, which is a further deep dive into the linguistics of Doggo. Even more historical origins, even more context. Lauren is contributing Australia. Even more Australian intuitions about where Doggo might come from. So that's on our Patreon. It is thanks to Lauren that I was able to identify Doggo as probably coming from Australia. So thanks, Lauren. Everyone should have an Australian on their consultant list. I think so. We also have previous Patreon bonus episodes, which include how to teach yourself even more linguistics, um, which includes also our top recommendations for books, videos, and further resources for self-study, and also how to sell your awesome linguistic skills to employers. So if you are thinking of doing a linguistics degree, you are currently doing one and thinking about your next job, or you're looking for a career change, that has got you covered. And there's also more. So all sides of the linguistic spectrum. And if you have ideas of things you'd like to hear from us on the podcast or on the bonus episodes, you can also do that at Patreon. And speaking of this, we reached our sustainability goal on Patreon last month. Yay! Yay! Which means that we officially have the funds to keep paying our producer and our transcriber, who are often the same person, and our audio hosting fees, which is not the same person. And I think by the time we record the next month's episode, we may have reached our next goal based on current trends, which is Operation Get Gretchen a Good Microphone. Better microphone. I am so excited <laughs> about this goal. This is definitely one of those ones where our Patreon uh, supporters help everybody win. Yeah, everybody wins. You all get to hear me on a better microphone. I win. I'm tired of this too. So this might be the last episode where I sound kind of scratchy, hopefully... So that is www.patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or you can find the link at lingthusiasm.com. Oh gosh, please. Yes, please. <laughs> Help Gretchen get a better mic. Uh, stay tuned to the next episode where you find out if this was successful. It's going to be a great reveal as soon as you say like a single line. Yeah. I think I do the intro next time too. Constituency is the fancy way of saying that stuff is made up of other stuff. And so that's our fancy word for this very basic fact that is kind of the main force of today's episode. And so far on the podcast, we've been approaching language from kind of two ends. We've had this tiny granular end. We've talked about sounds, like in the IPA episode, and we've definitely not stopped talking about sounds. And we've talked about words a lot. We've definitely not stopped talking about words either. And we've also been approaching language from the big macro society end, talking about language and world peace or kids' role in language change. 
But we haven't talked about part in between, about how the little bits become a capital L language. How does that transition happen? And this is a bigger question for one episode, but we're going to start with that. And so I think it's important, even though we talk about sounds a lot and we talk about words a lot, but languages aren't just lists of words. So you, you need something more than words here. Okay, I think languages can be a list of words because have you ever seen those movie cuts where they put all of the words in alphabetical order. For the organizers among you, this is like the most excellent use of somebody's time. It's so good. This is like those deconstructed salads where they line up all the, you know, tomatoes and the pieces of radish in pretty patterns rather than in a tossed salad. But in this in this case it's alphabetical patterns. It's alphabetical patterns. So there's of Oz the Wizard, which was some guy who put all of the words in the Wizard of Oz, you know, so it starts out with ah uh, and then gradually works its way down to like wizard, wizard, wizard. And there's also a Star Wars recut, which I find it's just very, um, it's very meditative when you've listened to the word Alderaan 20 times and you're just kind of in the zone. We will link to those if you have somehow missed them or if you just want to experience them again. But I, yeah, I don't think, I don't think that's really, if all of your movies just had all their words in alphabetical order, I don't think that would be a very good movie watching experience. It'd be an interesting avant-garde movie experience once to watch a movie that was like deliberately designed in alphabetical order. Yeah, and you'd kind of hope it's a short story for the sake of someone's linguistic ingenuity. Yeah, I'd watch a short film, maximum 20 minutes. Someone please make that. So it's not just about the words next door. So you can't just look at one word and what is immediately next to it. This structure and the constituency is happening across bigger relationships and groups of words. Yeah, there's units of words that aren't always obvious from what's next door. And my favorite example of this, best example, is the phrase time flies like an arrow which is with the corollary, fruit flies like a banana. I just, it's still just, it's just so perfect. It's so beautiful. I, I, I know we have this problem sometimes with linguistics, where if you've done one intro to linguistics course, you've done a few because everyone uses the same anecdotes, but there's just something so perfectly constructed about this structural ambiguity. Yeah, so if somehow, I don't know if you've missed the, the ambiguity uh, or if you just want to hear it explained to you, time flies like an arrow is refers to time, uh, which is a thing that flies like an arrow flies. Whereas fruit flies like a banana does not mean that apples and oranges and pears all soar across the room in the same way that banana soars across the room, which maybe they do. But it refers to fruit flies, which are kind of flies, are, who are fond of bananas. So in the first sentence, time is the thing that is doing something. And in the second sentence, fruit flies are the thing that is doing something. So the sentences are being kind of cut up in different ways and that gives them their different readings. Or to use the terminology that we're introducing in this episode, time is a constituent by itself. Well, all words are constituents by themselves, which is not terribly interesting. But time flies is not a constituent by itself. The flies part goes with the like an arrow part. Whereas in the second sentence, fruit flies is a constituent by itself. And then the like a banana part is also another type of constituent. So how you group the words, even when flies and like are both, you know, are the same in both sentences, how you group them is what's changing the meaning there. So there's another example of structural ambiguity, which is from the BBC radio drama Cabin Pressure, which is hilarious, uh, and you should all listen to it. But in one case, one of the characters says, oh, I know what's going on. I went on a course on understanding people in Ipswich. And the other character says, well, if I ever want the people of Ipswich understood, I'll let you know. I So I had the understanding people in Ipswich as one constituent in my head when I first read. I wasn't reading it very carefully on your, you had a blog post about it, which we'll link to. And I was like, why would you need to, is it a dialect thing? Do people in Ipswich have? So I completely fell. Yeah, you, you completely the... got the, the wrong interpretation. So obviously there are generic courses of understanding people and some of them, one assumes, happen in Ipswich. But in this case, the character is deliberately misinterpreting uh, the other one and saying, well, yeah, that's fine for the people of Ipswich, but what about the person in front of us right now who is, who's not from Ipswich? A couple of years ago, you had the Lingvids, mm -hmm. 
video series and you did a little mm. bit of demonstrating how these constituents can move around and be analysed in relation to each yeah. other. Yeah, so we did a series of, of video before I decided to become an audio person rather than a video person. And one of the questions that we, we asked for the purpose of the video is, is a sentence more like a bracelet or like a mobile? So you can think of a couple analogies for how a sentence works. And in a bracelet analogy, you think of, okay, if the words in a sentence are kind of like beads on a string, the way we see a sentence written on a page and it's just flat, and there's the one word, and the beads can only really notice or are influenced by the beads directly next to them, because that's all that's there that's touching yeah. them. And there's just one string that runs through the whole thing. Whereas if you make a mobile, like a hanging mobile from a ceiling, some people say mobile, then you have stuff hanging off of stuff. And then some of the bits that hang off have other things hanging on from them. And so there's dependencies and there's relationships between some of the parts of the tree or some of the parts of the structure that are groups that can have, you know, you could say something like, so if you have something like a course on understanding people in Ipswich, is it a course on understanding people and the whole course is in Ipswich. So in Ipswich and course on understanding people both hang off the two parts at the top of the mobile. Or is it a course on understanding people in Ipswich, in which case people and in Ipswich are hanging off the same bit and the course on understanding people is all the way at the top. So there's kind of ways of thinking of how to group things. So that's a video that you can watch. It's a little bit easier. You can't see me, but I'm gesturing. <laughs> there's ways of thinking about things, but conveniently in videos, there are also ways of seeing yeah. things to go with that explanation. So that's on the Lingvid videos. And we'll link to that too. And the fancy word that linguists give this particular type of constituents where there's two different meanings or more than one different meaning, structural ambiguity. But we're going we're gonna to stick with introducing one new term at a time so you don't have to remember structural ambiguity if you don't want to. And we, you've talked about some metaphors yeah. for so like bracelets or mobiles for how constituents can relate to each other. Um, some people also use the idea of like nesting dolls inside each other for constituents or bowls that get bigger and bigger and nest each other. The problem that I have with that, and like I get that stuff nests, is that it's hard to account for several things happening. It's very linear, like there's only there's only one set of layers as you go out. And yeah. that's not what generally happens with sentences. There's generally more than one kind of set. So I thought of a new metaphor, which okay. I'm very proud to share with you guys. So this is a cooking metaphor. Yes. I'm on board already. So if you're making a cake, you have a set of steps to follow. And, you know, so you cream the butter and the sugar and then you add the eggs and you add the vanilla. And then you go over to another bowl and you have the flour and you have the baking powder and you have the salt and the, you know, cinnamon or something if you want it. And you mix those together and then you add the one bowl to the other bowl. Yep. And then sometimes you also add pre-prepared ingredients like chocolate chips also have stuff in them. They have cocoa butter and... What, what are they constituted of? Hmm. And so there's several different kind of subroutines or sub bowls or sub containers that you need to take care of separately. And each of those has a particular order that you're adding stuff in. And then also sometimes you have to go to this other bowl and do stuff. Or when I make cream cheese brownies, which is a recipe that I like a lot, you make the brownie stuff and then you have to make the cream cheese mixture and you add the sugar to the cream cheese and stuff. And then you swirl the, the cream cheese mixture on top. So you have like several bowls going on. So it's not just like one set of nesting bowls, it's like when you do stuff. And exactly the same ingredients you use for your cream cheese brownies, I might use to make um, chocolate chip cookies. With cream cheese icing. With cream cheese icing. I don't, you you yeah. could do that. I don't know if anyone has, but it sounds Let's good. Let's see some kind of weird biscuit sandwich. I mean, it wouldn't be as tasty, but it would be still a valid use of the same set of materials. I think we need to determine this empirically and have a bake-off. Okay. I have not made that recipe <laughs> before, so I feel like I'm at something of a disadvantage. All, all <laughs> novel baked goods, all novel utterances. So in the same way that I can use exactly the same ingredients to make banana pancakes or banana muffins, mm -hmm. but the way that the order in which you pull them together creates something different. Yeah, and what you put in first and what you, what you mix separately... Or making, you know, something like a sauce for something. You know, you make the salad and then you make the salad dressing and you mix the salad dressing in its own bowl and then you can pour it over the salad as one thing. That's different yeah. from, you know, making a salad where you throw the salad dressing in with all the other ingredients, like, all separately. And so what that's getting at is something like, if you have time flies like an arrow, you can just kind of add each, you know, time gets added to flies like an arrow, flies gets added to flies like an arrow, like gets added to an arrow. But if you have something like fruit flies like a banana, you've got to combine fruit and flies together first. <laughs> I have a bowl of fruit flies here, Gretchen. 
<laughs> this is my baking. I'm really good at baking. Mmm, <laughs> So if you have fruit flies or raisins or something that you want to put in your banana, you have to combine fruit and flies together as words before you can add that whole thing to like a banana. Yeah. I just want to suggest for a moment that maybe some of the more attentive listeners are wondering if we're not just talking about something that they think of as grammar. Mm. I think grammar is often used imprecisely, and so constituency is a specific thing within the idea of grammar. So yeah, this is this is partially grammar, but it's useful to have a, to divide that up into specific ideas. Yeah, so this is one particular part of putting together words to create meaning. I thought you were going to say, I think some of our more astute listeners may be wondering if we're not talking about politics, because constituency is also a thing in politics. Sorry for anyone who found this thinking it was a politics podcast. Um, not a politics podcast. So electoral districts are also known as constituencies, and a constituent is a person who lives in an electoral district, and they come from the same metaphor. They're related to the word constitute. So a person who's a constituent decides who constitutes their parliament or their congress or their set of representatives in politics. So they're related, but they're not the same thing. So we've been talking about this as though it just objectively exists, but how do we know constituency exists other than you talking about bowls and uh, other metaphors? And also, I think how if you can't create one of these ambiguities that proves very nicely that clearly there's something going on, but obviously not all sentences are ambiguous. And so how do you how do you do this? And the cool thing is that there are totally ways to do this. <laughs> there is totes science, guys. This is us getting our... Uh, linguist lab coats on. So you know how in chemistry you can like add drops of a known chemical to a mystery li liquid and see if it turns green or something? I don't know very much about chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> this is what all the scientists do in the movies. These are definitely not chemistry lab coats, people. And then it'll tell you like, if it turns purple, it'll tell you whether it's an acid or a base or something like this. So there is stuff you can add to sentences that's known quantities that behaves in, in certain ways around constituents and then see what happens and see see whether a particular piece of, of a new sentence is a constituent or not. So we don't have something like a large hadron collider to kind of show you around. A large uh, hadron constituent, sir! <laughs> yeah, unfortunately we haven't built one of those to like smash words and phrases into each other. Um, but that's why linguistics is really cool, because like you don't even need the imaginary lab coats that we're wearing right now. You just Definitely need... Wearing right now some linguistic intuitions and you can do the science. You can do the science right there in your ears, in your mouth, in your talking. In the privacy of your own mouth. <laughs> in the privacy of your own home, you too can do the science. You don't need like test tubes or safety goggles. Try this at home. Try this at home. Do try this at home. It's okay. It won't break anything. Other than some rules of constituents. No constituents are harmed in the making of this experiment. So there are a whole range of constituency tests that linguists use to figure out whether something is a constituent or not, and these are often language dependent. Some of them you can use in a lot of languages, others are really specific to a particular language. And there are some good videos, and there's actually, you know, the, the Wikipedia summary for this is pretty good as a starting point. So we're not going to go through all of the main tests for English constituency testing, but we are going to share a couple to give you an idea of how it works. Yeah, and we will link to more lists, so if you think I want to test this. The core idea of a constituency test is you want to say, I've got a sentence, and I've got a, a couple words in this sentence, so any individual word is going to be a constituent, because you can say it by itself if you want. So that's not very interesting. But you've got, you know, two words, or three words, or five words, a string of words in the sentence, and you want to say, are these words functioning together as a unit? Or, you know, is there some break between them? You know, and the whole sentence is also going to be a constituent. But within a sentence, you're going to have some groups of words that are like more influenced by each other and some that aren't. And so what we're doing is saying, okay, there's various ways of saying, here's a group of words that we're wondering about. Let's put it through a bunch of other contexts where we know that things that are units do act together. And if this one does that too, then it is a constituent. And if it doesn't do that too, then it's not. So we need a test subject. I think we should use time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. <laughs> okay, that is a, a very excellent set of guinea pigs to bring into the lab space. Yeah, so this will let us give us some contrasts. 
we've kind of spoiled it for you already, but we want to find out if time flies is a constituent. And we also want to see if, if fruit flies is a constituent. So the first test that we are going to subject them to is the questions test, which is more or less using questions to see if they can stand alone. Because often if you ask someone a question, they just answer with a standalone response. So if you say to someone, what did you do last night? They don't say, last night I went to the cinema. They just say, I went to the cinema. You can, you can answer with a fragment. And those fragments are all constituents. So if we say, what likes a banana? We can answer that with fruit flies. Yeah. But if we say, what likes an arrow? We don't want to answer that time flies. Or like we could, but it would mean something very, very different. And so this is telling us that fruit flies is a constituent. You can use it as an answer to a question. And time flies is not a constituent. But if we say, what flies like an arrow? We can just answer that time. And that's totally fine. Yep. Um, so sometimes you need to think creatively that that question needs to be. Yeah. Whereas what, what flies like a banana is literally only a banana. Another test that we could subject them to is the test of substitution. And so this means because we know that any individual word is a constituent, if you can find an individual word that you can substitute for a longer string of words that you're wondering about, then that means that this longer string of words has to also be a constituent, as long as the sentence kind of keeps doing the same thing. So, for example, you could say, I like cake, or you could say the very beautiful, intelligent woman who has just finished her job in London is moving back to Melbourne to do a new job, likes cake. Although the, the second one is very, very long, it fills basically exactly the same role in the sentence as the one letter pronoun I. And in this case, just semantically happened to be the same person. Happens to be true. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, so often people use pronouns for this. You can substitute the entire thing with a pronoun. So if we take our time flies example, if we say time flies like an arrow, you so say it flies like an arrow. But if we want to say is time flies a constituent, then you have to say it likes a banana or they like a banana. They like an arrow? We've got we've got cross contamination on the sentences. So hard to do orally. Yeah, they an arrow. And if that's supposed to mean the same thing, time flies like oh, we're dealing with little flapping time lords, we're not dealing with time flying. Yeah. Whereas for fruit flies like a banana, if you have it flies like a banana, again, you've created this very different sentence where you're talking about something that is thrown across the room. Whereas they like a banana is a reasonable and cogent substitute for fruit flies like a banana. There is also another thing that is not part of the standard canon of constituency tests, but I like it as a way of showing that anyone actually who uses the internet knows instinctively what a constituent is. And that's because when we use hyperlinks and clickable links on the internet, we rarely break constituent boundaries with those. We usually have a single constituent or, or a, a phrase within a single hyperlink. So this is like the anchor text for hyperlinks. So when you, you know, you highlight a couple words and then you like make them into a link and the words that you highlighted are probably a constituent. You're probably already doing this subconsciously. So you would say if you were writing about time flies like an arrow, you might have a hyperlink for time and that would take you to a dictionary definition of time. Mm -hmm. And you might have flies like an arrow might be a hyperlink to a video that shows an arrow flying. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have the other sentence, you might have something like fruit flies and that takes you to the Wikipedia page for fruit flies. And you might have like a banana and then you have a list of animals that eat fruit. But you'd be unlikely probably to make time flies the anchor text of your of your hyperlink unless you're talking about time lord flies, which in which case it would be a constituent. Yeah, and it would be very, very unlikely to get something like time flies like. Oh yeah, that'd be really weird. But it's surprisingly common. Next time you're reading an article that has links in it, check them out to see if they're constituents. There's a fun thing to do. My favorite example of people doing subconscious constituents takes us back to Doggo. Yes. So <laughs> this is the best thing. I'm, I'm already there. One of the people behind the, the Doggo thing is a there's a Twitter account called at dog rates dog underscore rates by a guy named Matt Nelson. A, a lot of people have seen it. It has like two million followers. You've probably seen this account. Um, and it'll be like, what a cute pupper 1010 would would pet. And it's great. But he also started a second more experimental Twitter account. And it's called at dog underscore feelings. 
And this is an account where the dog just like says stuff in kind of a like spaced out doggy sort of voice. And it's more interesting linguistically to my mind at the moment when we're talking about constituency because what this dog character does on this Twitter account, which we're definitely going to link to and you should definitely go check out because it's really funny, is the the conceit of the account is to, about is words in all lowercase and he'll put periods between every couple words sometimes after a single word sometimes after two or three words so sometimes even go up to like four and so he'll put periods between them periodically kind of in like the rhythm of a wagging tail or like you know dogs aren't too super smart <laughs> um linguistically so they'll they'll kind of pause a lot and what's really interesting to me is that the pauses often obey constituency boundaries i'm sure this guy knows no linguistics i don't think he's doing it consciously but even intuitively it's falling into consent i mean i can read a couple of examples but it does take us into the always difficult territory of how written means sound out loud i think we should read an example or two okay i'll do my best thoughts of dog voice my human is that again i can tell because he only gave me one pat when I put my head in his lap. And so what's cool about this is all of these pauses are constituents. So my human, that's a constituent, is sad again, is a constituent. Whereas if instead it had been my human is sad again, then that wouldn't have been a constituent. So speaking of pauses, Lauren, you do, you do prosody. I don't do prosody, but I really like it. I mean, I do prosody as in I modulate the way that I speak <laughs> using intonation. I don't. I talk like a robot. Yeah. I have to put this in post hoc in the editing phase. So intonation contours are, we, we don't often think about what they contribute, but when it comes to spoken language, they are often the thing that is doing the heavy lifting in disambiguating sentences. So things like time flies like an arrow and fruit flies like a banana. The intonation there helps people. It's not as useful as some other examples. Whereas if you just say time flies like an arrow, it's harder to, to tell if that's what you mean by it. Yeah. And so prosody can often give us some clues as to what's happening in terms of how the constituents are grouped, and that helps disambiguate things. So my favourite meme example is a picture of uh, some Arctic ice and some glow sticks and small fluffy things uh, with the line down the bottom, stop clubbing baby seals! Which, when you say it that way, entirely deserves kind of dancing. Baby seals, what are you doing partying so late? You've got to get up tomorrow. Oh, you're only babies. You're only babies. Are you even allowed to drink yet? Which has an obviously very different reading to stop clubbing baby seals. Um, yeah, as in stop, stop hitting them with clubs. And so it's prosody that is, and it's the absence of prosody in the photo meme that is creating the joke. And these memes often come around with, Oh, this is the importance of commas. Yeah. But commas are just an imperfect representation of prosody. Yeah. But I think a lot of these ambiguity examples work better in writing, precisely because we're so good at prosody. Um, like how you didn't get the people in Ipswich example, even though it was totally clear to me listening to the audio of it. You would have to be deliberately trying very hard to miss here. I did a course on... I've done a course on understanding people in Ipswich. So prosody is doing all the heavy lifting there and is completely underrated. So... Just given given a shout out to my mate Prosody. Yeah. Well, and this is so this is another thing. It's not necessarily terribly good as a constituency test because commas are weird and generally linguists don't like to use written stuff as a test. But if you can think of like where could you put commas in this sentence and have the meaning still be preserved, those are going to be constituency boundaries. It's not necessarily going to be all of them, but it's going to be some of them. Yeah. Because that's that's one of the things that pauses indicate is, is where there are some breaks between stuff. We've been talking about things like intonation and what words are entirely with English example sentences. Um, that is because that is the language that is the medium of this podcast. But we really, as always, because we like talking about all of the world's languages, we want to stress that these certain types of tests can be done. All languages break down structures to some degree in this way. Yeah, all languages have constituents that have stuff that is more closely associated than other stuff. Which tests you can use to show that differs depending on the language and what exactly they use to create those relationships. So in some cases, you can do constituency with parts of a single word, not just with groups of words as a whole. So there's some examples of that in English. One example that is very clear 
is undoable. So undoable can mean two things. One thing it can mean is it's undoable. It's not able to be done. And then the other thing it can mean is it's undoable, which is it's able to be undone. As in, you can control Z this. You can control Z this. There's an eraser here, whereas this is just impossible. It's undoable. And you can get more elaborate types of constituency with, uh, you know, with things, with things on a word as well as between words. So one example that I have for this comes from my misspent Latin education, which was not misspent at all. I loved it. <laughs> and this is a thing that Latin poems would do, which is they would really mess around with the word order. Like in English, the word order is very important. Latin poems especially would often just, you know, you'd have like the, if you had a phrase like from a long river or something, you'd have like the river in one line of the poem and the long in another line of the poem. And you had to realize that they were actually being associated with each other. And it wasn't just like there's from a river and there's from a long something. <laughs> you had to realize that they were constituent together and that they were actually trying to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And the poet had just moved them around to get like a better rhythm. Right. And so the way that you would do this in Latin is that the endings would have to match. So if you have the word for river in Latin is fluvius. So if you have fluvius, that's the form of it when it's a subject. Yep. And then you have longus, which would be the form of the adjective when it's a, uh, a subject matching its, its masculine os ending. So those would be the same thing. But if you have from a long river, that's the ablative. So now you have fluvio longo. And even if longo is in line one and fluvio is in line three, you can still be like, oh, well, they're both in the masculine ablative singular. Maybe they're actually supposed to be together. Maybe they're actually constituent. So like in English, constituents tend to be right next to each other. But in other languages, you can you can really move them around and you have something else that tells you, oh, these are things that you're supposed to be interpreting together. So is that how you kind of first encountered the idea of constituency? Yeah, I was like decoding poems in high school and thinking, oh, these two things associate. And then when I got to constituency later, I was like, oh, this is the same thing. Wow. How did you first encounter constituency? I, before thinking about it in terms of linguistics, I think my first realization that different words and sets of words could all fill the same kind of grammatical spot and be one constituent was essentially playing a version of Mad Libs. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, you know, if they wanted something that was like a noun, you could just write but, or you could write my brother's big fat smelly butt. And either way, it would still work and be hilarious. Yeah. Very hilarious when you're like seven. So uh, <laughs> that is where I... <laughs> <laughs> it was in that's great trying to be funny in mad libs that taught me to think about just how much you could cram in while it's still actually being the same type of constituent yeah and i mean and this gets us back to the grammatical gender point and which we talked about in episode two about pronouns it was just like why do languages even bother with having gender well sometimes it can help you figure out what's a constituent because yeah. if you have adjectives that have to agree with gender, particularly when you have a language like Latin or Old English would do this too, where you could wrap around like this, it could help you find it. It was like a little like, you know, one of those like GPS microchips you put in your dog <laughs> to be like, this, this is where, this is, we've tagged you, you belong with me. <laughs> I think, but I think there's also a larger theoretical importance to why we should care about constituents. And that goes back to the um, thing we were talking about earlier, language isn't just made up of individual words. You can't just take all the words from a film and remix them. Yeah, I think humans don't just learn how to make sentences by memorizing all of the possible sentences. Yeah. Like, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. Like, I came up with ends and you understood it even the first time you heard it because you knew what the words meant and you knew how to interpret the constituent relationships between those words. It's a thing that languages have where you can make up right now a sentence that no one's ever heard before because you know about the relationships between them. It fills in, as we said, that kind of middle spot between just individual words or sounds and this larger, full discourse conversation. There's other things that fill it in. We can talk about semantics at some point. Um, but yeah, figuring out what language is in the human mind, since we don't just say individual words, is partly figuring out like what kinds of constituency relationships do we have. And I think I think there's a practical importance to it. So one of the exercises that intro linguistic students typically get set is you need to do a bunch of constituency tests and then you need to draw a tree. But the trees themselves are, are, are only a means to an end. They're not an end in themselves. They're just a representation 
of all the constituency information you can extract from this sentence in a very convenient and visual visual form. And then when you start looking at them, then you can say, oh, okay, well, here's how these two sentences actually have the same structure because their trees look identical. And when you draw syntactic trees, it's one way to very quickly see that sentences that look the same on the surface have different structures. So fruit flies like a banana, the fruit and the flies are together as a constituent and they're in a separate node in the tree. Whereas time flies like an arrow, time is all alone, lonely time in its lonely node. And so you very quickly see that even though they appear the same, their structures are different. Yeah, so it's a convenient way of visualizing that information and conveying that. But a lot of people get very buried in the audience to figure out what are these constituents and what's going on here. And it can be hard the first, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 trees that you draw and every single set of words you have to run through the set of constituency tests. But it's kind of like learning how to navigate or learning how to make a map of the terrain, thinking about what kinds of things have relationships and getting good at just spotting them. Like, I don't have to run constituency tests on every sentence I see now to see whether something's a constituent because most of the common types of ones, I can just spot them. Yeah. And you know, occasionally I get something confusing. I'm like, oh, is that a constituent? I have the tests available, but most of the time I don't need them just because it's the practice type thing that you do when you're like beginning to flex your linguistic muscles. And I think sometimes people just think that like syntactic tree drawing is some academic exercise that we just make our students do so that they suffer or, <laughs> you know, or if they are the subset of people who tend to go on and study syntax, who immediately fall in love with it and draw trees to everything. Or it's kind of like a meaningless intellectual exercise. Yeah. Like, oh, I can do Sudoku. I can draw syntax trees. Great. Like, it's fun. But where do you go from there? But they do have really important implications, especially in the field of of computer language and how computers interact with language. So, um, for example, Google Translate, just like in your films, Google doesn't just go word by word and translate each individual word when you put a sentence into their translation portal. Instead, what happens is it starts thinking in terms of constituents and in terms of larger phrases, and it tries to match those up within its corpus. And similarly with their search engines, you may type in a whole sentence, but it knows how to extract the constituents that are relevant for searching. Yeah, anything that's trying to do like a natural language interface is trying to figure out, okay, how do you understand the parts of a natural language thing? So there are practical reasons why constituency is important. So once you get used to constituency, you can make lots of fun jokes with structural ambiguity and lots of fun jokes with time flies. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. I blog and tweet as Superlinguo. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistics questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Current bonus topics include behind-the-scenes story of Doggo Speak and how to explain linguistics to employers, how to teach yourself linguistics, and an episode on swearing. And you can help us pick the next topic by becoming a patron. If you can't afford to pledge, that's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you could rate us on iTunes or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. We are especially doing a bit of a shout out to our Australian, Canadian and Great British iTunes using listeners to help us be rated on those stores. So something you might not know is that iTunes only gives an average based on the country. So we have quite a few ratings on American iTunes now, but if you're from another country and you'd like to rate us on iTunes, that would be super awesome. We are unconstrained by geography. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our producer is Claire, and our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!